uh, line research or score based models, for example, people have applied those methods to uh, image generation on uh, image net, uh, be able to outperform GANs as well on this data set. People have also used this for audio synthesis, for text to speech generation, and molecule generation, shape generation, also material design, also time series prediction. And in all those cases, they are able to show like better performance than the previous state of the art. And for some future directions, you have already seen like how we can generate very realistic images. And this also means um, if at the hands of a malicious people, they might be able to generate some deep fakes uh, and to, uh, to basically do some harmful things. So we want to mitigate those potential negative societal impacts. We want to produce methods that can detect those deep fakes, or we want to address the potential issues uh, from the racial biases and other biases in the training data set. And in addition, you can also see we already uh, show some promising results of solving inverse problems in medical imaging, and the same principle can be applied to other disciplines of science and, and engineering. For example, we can use the score-based models to solve potentially systematic tomography to detect mineral concentrations. We can also use them to um, do imaging for cryogenic electron microscopy. And those can be used to analyze the structures of viruses. And at a higher level, why do we want to do research on generative models? First of all, generative modeling actually imitates the creativity procedure of humans. So uh, for a truly general artificial intelligence agent, we want it to have some creativity. And the generative models allows you to do art, to do language, and uh, to imitate a lot, of, a lot of creativity behavior. And in addition, generative models are important for artificial intelligence agents to understand the real world. So what the uh, physicist Richard Feynman has said, what I can't create, I don't understand. If I claim to understand what an apple is, I should be able to, ima to imagine its picture in my head, to imagine its taste in my mind. So uh, that means if we can generate things, we might be able to understand things better. That's why we want generative techniques. Finally, as a summary, I'm gonna show that uh, the score function which is the gradient of distributions, it can be estimated easily. This is because the model architecture is more flexible, no need to be normalized, no need to be invertible, unlike autoregressive models or normalizing flu models. The training is stable, there is no minimax optimization, unlike generative, generative adversarial networks. It achieves better comparable sample quality to GANs. Stay here without performance on CIFAT 10 and many other applications as demonstrated by other people. Scalable to images of a larger resolution of millions of dimensions. You can also use it to compute the exact likelihood. So many other people have demonstrated better likelihood the state of that performance on CIFAT 10 and also applied the same approach to lossless data compression. It also has connection to normalizing flow models. And finally, some controllable generation applications involving solving inverse problems in many different disciplines. And uh, yeah, that's essentially the talk today. Uh, you can see this is a very promising direction for generative modeling has many applications. And uh, any questions? Thanks, thanks, Yang, for the excellent talk. So now, uh, yeah, let's take some questions. Uh, I have a question. So mm -hmm. uh, for your first work on sliced uh, uh, score estimation, I, yeah, I was curious about the theoretical guarantee. So I went into your paper and saw you can show the proposed estimator has uh, consistency and asymptotic normality. So I was curious, maybe this is a trivial question, but uh, so the fact that the, your estimator converge to the true uh, gradient of the log of the density, does it imply the, the density that come out of your estimation also converge to the true density of the data. 
So because uh, you are doing this derivatives and logs and so on, so I wonder if uh, that yeah. will translate. Yeah, so the theoretical results in that paper is actually in terms of the density. So it says oh, that the density. density. Yeah. Okay, okay. Not in terms of a score, but uh, you can imagine that if the density is a consistent and the score is also consistent. Okay, I see, I see. So then does that mean you can, this is a way to uh, approximate the, because the, the distance here you're using is the, like the two norm, uh, squared norm uh, mm -hmm. distance between two probability distributions. So does that mean this can approximate any, like this can be an efficient way to compute the uh, L2 norm of any high dimensional distributions, any two high dimensional distributions. Uh, so by computing. doing these projections. Uh, yeah, so um, if the projection distribution has certain property, then this is guaranteed to be true. So essentially we just want the projection direction to cover all direction all angular directions in the space. If it can cover all directions, then of course, uh, if those two vector fields do not match each other, then there exists a certain direction such that the projection do not match each other. So in those cases, uh, minimizing the difference between projected vector fields are equivalent to minimizing the original difference between the high dimensional vector fields. I see, I see. Yeah, this is very interesting because I, yeah, I, I encountered some problems uh, while doing some totally different uh, problems, uh, which uh, where, where the main difficulty is to estimate, for example, the total variation distance uh, between two high dimensional distributions and finding mm -hmm. a, a time, like the efficient way to estimate that. And I think, I mean, if you can do two norm, then one norm can also be similarly bounded, I believe. That there, there are like relations between them, so. Yeah, so, I think, yeah, I think so. Uh, it's essentially a Monte Carlo estimation of the two norm. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, as Renjie has mentioned, the Hutchinson's trace estimator has applied the same technique. And they also sketching techniques in numerical analysis, basically also doing those projections for Monte Carlo estimation with high dimensional quantities. So I think like for different norms, it's probably also possible to use some stochastic estimation. It's not uh, a free launch though, because stochastic estimation might have some large variance. So sometimes if the, if the object we want to study does not have good properties, then the variance could be large. But in, at least in our case, the variance are quite good. I see. Right. Thank you. Yeah, so there's a question in chat. Uh, yeah, so I guess this is just the matter of like, uh, like I guess, notations or terminologies. Mm -hmm. People just talk about deep neural networks without yeah, yeah, yeah. actually, you know, meaning like it's, yeah. it's 10 layers or 20 layers. So it's... Uh, yeah. yeah, it's good. It's good to clarify. So here I only show three layers because it's a running example. I can't realize 20 layers uh, with animation. So, uh, so here the logic works for three layers. It also works for 20 layers or 100 layers, uh, just uh, analogously. Uh, I just show you here, it's a illustration only, not what happens in practice. Yeah, I think, yeah, this is good feedback. I can try to clarify this next time. Yeah, are there any other questions? Otherwise, yeah, I'll so ask one, okay. one more, one, oh, sorry. <laughs> no, no, I have a lot of questions, so you guys ask first. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Th thanks for the talk. Uh, Okay, so I guess maybe two quick questions. One is in response to Lele's question, I guess you, you when you're saying that in our case, the variance is small, this is empirically so, right? Like by, by yeah. the result, okay. Uh, exactly, and, yeah. and, and, 
I, I guess my second question is, is, is more, more generic since we have you here. You, you're definitely an expert in all this and you mentioned future works and I guess, I guess definitely one, one future direction is, is applying your framework to, as you said, materials discovery or whatever different field. Um, so yeah. I, I, maybe maybe two questions on this. One is what is uh, what is your broader feeling about the status of this of, of generative modeling, uh, given your work? Like what are what are specific like algorithmic wise or even theory wise? Like what what are what are the areas that you see kind of interest? Since you mentioned that it's a it's a very interesting area. And then how, how, can you comment on how data hungry are these, are these uh, uh, techniques? Uh, I mean, I, I, I feel like guns are, for example, like how do these things compare? Yeah, so there are two questions. The first question is uh, some high level comment on genetic modeling research, uh, I guess, more or less like this. So uh, yeah, I think, uh, if we want to position the research of genetic modeling in the large field of machine learning, I think genetic modeling is uh, quite critical. It's like around the center of the research of machine learning because it is uh, like a very strong method for unsupervised learning. They essentially model the whole joint distribution of the data without, requir without requiring labels. So once you have the genetic model, you essentially have the data set itself. All possible information is uh, captured by the genetic model. I think progress in genetic modeling uh, is very important for like various types of downstream applications in machine learning. And um, yeah, so uh, for the research field itself, for genetic modeling, I think score-based models uh, is a very important part of the future because uh, all us, what we haven't seen in the talk, it can generate samples of very high quality empirically and also very high likelihood and uh, uh, also very suitable for solving various inverse problems. So those properties do not exist for other family of genetic models. Uh, so nowadays, the only drawback is that those models are kind of a slow to sample from, but there are already uh, recent work to show you that you only need like four iterations to generate very good samples. So it's actually comparable in terms of uh, sampling speed to GANs. So considering all those progress, uh, I would think score-based models uh, is the future of uh, genetic modeling and uh, should be able to uh, see many more applications of genetic models in other fields due to the progress of uh, score-based models. And in terms of uh, um, being data hungry, yeah, I think this is a very good question. Uh, in general, I did not observe Go best models to be more data hungry than GANs or, or other types of genetic models. Um, for some data sets like CIFA 10, it only has around uh, 50,000 training samples in the training data set, and we can already create some quite good samples from the data set. So I think 50,000 doesn't count as a lot of uh, data. Uh, yeah, but uh, sometimes it needs some data augmentation to uh, regularize the trading. But uh, in general, I think overall, it doesn't seem to be more data hungry, uh, seem to be comparable to classifiers, uh, other types of machine learning algorithms, some of those tasks. But indeed, if we really have only a small number of data points, then it's a new research direction. Like uh, if we only have 100, maybe 200, if we want to do few short generation, then yeah, it's something very interesting and worth studying in the future. Thank you. Yeah, there's a question in the chat asking how much is the sampling process slow compared to say GANs in general? So I, oh. I think it's related to yeah, the speed thing you mentioned. Yeah, the speed is very important because here uh, in this framework, we have a lot of noise perturbation and uh, uh, if there are a lot of uh, noise perturbation, we need a lot of uh, iterations. And each iteration requires invalidating the score model, which is a deep neural network. So the sampling speed will be thousands or hundreds of times slower than GANs. And this is uh, uh, the vanilla approach, but there exist better approaches to distill the generation capability from this framework. And the latest research shows you that you only need four iterations 
to generate high quality samples. In other words, the sampling speed is only four times slower than GANs. So I think it's a, uh, uh, the research is still going on. It's still making progress. So maybe in the future, the sampling speed won't be uh, won't be slower than guns. Uh, 